everyone uh, take a seat, sit down, settle down. Okay. <coughs> We've been speaking about determinants for the last couple of days. Uh, this will be the last day we speak about determinants. We're going to use them again later on in the course. We're going to need determinants to calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which are really important. This will be the last sort of lecture on determinants themselves. And this is more or less where we finished yesterday. Uh, we stated fact 2.11, which basically says that the determinant of a product is equal to the product of the determinants. We're not going to show that this is true. Um, if you wanted to, you could pretty easily show that it's true for uh, A and B, if A and B are both diagonal matrices, or if A and B are both uh, upper triangular matrices. And some of those ideas can get generalized to show that it is true uh, for any old matrix. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to proceed. Um, and so we have here fact 2.12. If you've got an invertible matrix A, then the determinant of that matrix is non-zero. And uh, the explanation here just relies on the product of the determinant being the determinant of the product. And we could write down this, right? So if you wanted to calculate the determinant of A multiplied by the determinant of A inverse, that would be the same thing as the determinant of A multiplied by A inverse. And we know that A multiplied by A inverse is the identity matrix. And we know that the determinant of the identity matrix is equal to 1. And so you've got the determinant of A multiplied by something. In this case, the determinant of A inverse is equal to 1. And this tells you immediately that these two quantities here on the left-hand side, the determinant of A and the determinant of A inverse, must both be non-zero because it would be impossible for one of them to be equal to 0, because then you'd have 0 multiplied by something is equal to 1, which, which can't happen. Do you have a question? Why the determinant of A? We don't know anything about A. The determinant of A could be anything. We don't know that it's equal to 1. Sure. What we, what we also get out of this, just as an additional remark, um, is also the following. The determinant of the inverse of a matrix, when the inverse exists, not every matrix is invertible, is just 1 divided by the determinant of the original matrix. So if you have a matrix A which has got a, deter a determinant of 5, then its inverse has a determinant of 1 fifth. Or if it's got a determinant of negative 3, then its inverse has got a determinant of negative 1 third. This is a, just, I guess, a, a nice thing to bear in mind. The next thing that we're going to look at is the adjoint. And we're going to look at the adjoint because uh, it's sort of theoretically useful. Um, we'll see that the adjoint also gives us an explicit formula for calculating the inverse of a matrix. Please don't ever use this. Don't ever actually do the computation. It's really difficult. It's much easier just to do Gauss reduction to, to find inverses. So we're going to now look at the, the joint. It's theoretically useful, but in terms of computation, it's absolutely awful. Try never, ever to work with it. OK. So the adjoint is defined as the transpose of the matrix of cofactors. So we're going to build this up in, in small pieces. So to every entry, in A, so for every entry in A, we can calculate a cofactor. Maybe there shouldn't be two. Let's make it four. For every entry in A, we can calculate a cofactor. Cij and that's how the cofactor is defined. The cofactor is just negative one to the power i plus j, 
multiplied by mij. Mij is just the minor, remember? So the, the minor will be uh, the determinant of a smaller matrix, which is formed by omitting the ith row and the jth column. So for every entry, we can find a cofactor. And now we can make a new matrix C, where every entry in C is the cofactor. So we create a new matrix. Create a new matrix C whose entries are these cofactors. Let's just say whose entries are CIJ, and you can call this the matrix of cofactors. Then we introduce the adjoint of A. The joint and the joint of A is the transpose of the cofactor matrix. Right, so this is a I guess quite a long and difficult thing to put together. First, you've got to go to your matrix. For each entry in the matrix, you calculate a cofactor. Then you take the transpose of this matrix, and that's the adjoint, right? And there's some really nice results about the adjoint of the matrix. So this will be fact, I guess we're now up to 2.13. In fact, 2.13 says the following. Um, A multiplied by the adjoint of A is just the determinant of A multiplied by the identity matrix. And we're going to try to understand this. And it'll take a while to really sort of unpick this. Maybe it's worth explaining, why is this a useful thing to do? Well, in principle, it gives us another way of calculating the inverse of a matrix. Because if, you, if A was invertible, then the determinant of A over here will be non-zero. If the determinant of A is non-zero, you can divide through by the determinant. And then you'd have A multiplied by 1 of the determinant times the adjoint is equal to the identity. And then this 1 of the determinant times by the adjoint would be your inverse. So this gives you a different way of calculating inverses. Um, and it's a useful thing to have in your back pocket. But in terms of actually doing computations, just do the Gauss reduction. It's much quicker. Right? But let's see if we can understand what they're saying here. Right? They're saying that if you take a matrix A, you multiply it by its adjoint, it gives you a new matrix. This new matrix is a diagonal matrix. The entries on the diagonal are all determinants of A. And the entries off the diagonal all equal to zero, right? That's what the sort of the structure or the shape of this matrix on the right-hand side is. It's determinant of A multiplied by the identity matrix. Determinant of A is just a constant. So a constant multiplied by the identity matrix. You just get that constant on the diagonal. All the other entries are zero, right? So we have to sort of try to understand why this is the case. And I'm going to start by writing down my matrix A. In fact, let me put it here. Write down my matrix A. So this will be A11, A12, dot, 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 A1N. So there's my first row. The second row will be A21, A22, A2N. And then A N one, A N two, A N N. So that over there is the matrix A. The matrix, or the adjoint of A, we write that down. Adjoint 
of A. It's going to be the transpose of the cofactor matrix. So the entries will be C11, and then normally this you might think is C12, it's actually C21. We've taken the transpose, so the indexes end up getting swapped. So this will be CN1. And normally you'd expect that this is C21, but because we've taken the transpose, this is actually C12. This is C22. And all the way down here, instead of being CN1, it's C1N. C2N. CN2. CNN. All right. So we have the matrix A, and we've got the adjoint of A. And we can maybe sort of understand now why this taking the transpose of the cofactor um, is important if we think about how we do matrix multiplication, right? When we do matrix multiplication, we're going to take a row from A, say this first row here, and it will be multiplied by a column. So this transpose means that that matrix multiplication we are now going to recognize in some cases. So let's just actually start thinking about um, what happens when we do the matrix multiplication, but when we do the matrix multiplication, let's, let's think about the result on the main diagonal. Right, so uh, consider going to do this matrix multiplication, A multiplied by the adjoint of A, but we're going to look at two different things first. First we're going to look at what happens on the diagonal, and then we'll think about what happens off the diagonal. So one. So if we think about the diagonal entries in the result, the diagonal entries in the product. You're going to get the diagonal entries by taking the first row of A, instead of multiplying it, you'll use the first column of the adjoint. Or you'll take the second row of A, the second column of the adjoint, the third row of A, the third column of the adjoint. So we'll take, let's actually just take a look at the first row, first column. We'll take something like this row here, and this column here when you do the matrix multiplication, okay? So A multiplied by the adjoint of A, the result in the first row and the first column is going to be A11 multiplied by C11. plus A12 multiplied by C12 plus A13 multiplied by C13 and so on until the last entry here is A1N, C1N. Okay. And we can rewrite this. Let's just rewrite that as a sum. So this will be a sum over A, 1, J, C, 1, J. And J runs from 1 up to N. So do we recognize that as anything? <coughs> w what is that then? something similar to the definition, well, not similar, it's exactly the definition of the determinant, right? This is the definition of the determinant where we have chosen to expand the determinant along the first uh, row of A. Yeah. No, no, no. 
so that's because of the way that a joint over there is defined. So let's just go back up and look at the adjoint. So we create a new matrix C whose entries are CIJ. So this would just be the matrix of the cofactors. And then the joint is defined as the transpose of that matrix. So when you take the transpose, rows becomes columns and the columns become rows, which effectively just means that those indexes are exchanged. So that's uh, why we have that's why we have the indexing in A looks normal, but the indexing in C looks reversed. But what is the cofactor? So the cofactor is just, didn't we write it up over there? Yeah, so the cofactor is just minus 1 to the i plus j multiplied by the minor, right? So that's the, the minor is that smaller determinant that you calculate, and then that minus 1 to the i plus j is that sort of plus or minus checkerboard pattern that you use when you're calculating the determinant. Okay, so this cofactor is, yeah, I mean, that cofactor is what you use when you calculate the determinant. Okay. So we, we say, the, oh, hold on, this is the determinant of A, right? So that was specifically for um, the first row, the first entry, but, uh, but in fact we can actually just show that this is the case for case row, case entry. So all the diagonals end up looking like this will be, okay, now we have to think very carefully. So it'll be row K, so A, K1, and then column uh, C, K1 plus A, K2, C, K2 plus A, K, N, C, K, N, which is again the determinant of A. So the diagonal entries Diagonal entries, they're easy to understand what's going on. We do this matrix multiplication, and then we recognize the matrix multiplication as that sum, and that sum just looks like, oh, the definition of the determinant when we expand along the appropriate row, row 1 or row k. Okay. So the more interesting question, or maybe the more difficult question, is what's going to happen on the off-diagonal um, entries, right? So our claim was... Our claim was that if you take the matrix A and you multiply it by its adjoint, it's equal to the determinant of A multiplied by the identity matrix. So the identity matrix has got ones on the diagonal. Those ones have been multiplied by the determinant of A, so we've got the determinant on the diagonal. And we've just shown that we do actually get the determinant on the diagonal. The question is now, why are we going to get zeros for all the other entries? So that's something we've got to understand. Why do we get zeros for all the other entries? Okay, so let's see. Uh, two. Off diagonal. So why are... I'll be with you in a moment. What do I mean by off diagonal? So if, if I've got a matrix like this... In fact, let me just actually use the matrix that we have here. This matrix here is a matrix where the entries on the diagonal are just the determinant of A. Okay, I've, I've run out of space. Let's write that differently. The matrix whose entries on the diagonal are just the determinant of A, and the entries off the diagonal, the entries everywhere else, or zero. So by off diagonal, we just mean those entries over there, right? And these entries up here. All the entries that aren't on the diagonal. All the entries where the row and the column index are different. Well, okay, so that's the claim. Fact 2.3, that's what fact 2.3 claims. And this is the reason, right? We've just had this discussion here that if we take this. Um, if we actually calculate this product, if you take A multiplied by the adjoint of A, right, you get, say, the first row times by the first column. That'll give you the entry in the result in row one, column one. So that'll give you this entry up here. And if we calculate the matrix multiplication, it's the first thing A11 multiplied by C11 plus A12 multiplied by C12 plus all the way down to A1n multiplied by C1n, which is what we have over there. And then we recognize that as just being the formula for calculating the determinant. Okay, so that's why we have a determinant 
on the diagonal entries. Okay, so now the question is, what's going to happen if we try to calculate something off the diagonal? So let's say we were to take this second row multiplied by the first column. Second row multiplied by the first column. Let's think about what happens over there. Right, so actually, the diagonal entries were that color, and then the off-diagonal entries are in this color. Right, they're the result of doing that product over there. Okay. So what's going to happen? Right, what's going to happen? Well, we end up with the following. So this was uh, A times by the adjoint of A. What is the result when we use the second row with the first column? So now we've got different indexes over there. Second row times by the first column. So it'll be A21 multiplied by C11 plus, let's just go through it. We'll get A21 multiplied by C11. So the first entry here multiplied by the first entry there. Then we'll get A22 multiplied by C12. Plus A22 multiplied by C12. Plus all the way down to A2N multiplied by C1N. Okay. <clears throat> and we look at this, and this doesn't seem quite right. Okay. If we took a look at the expression that we found a little bit earlier, over here, for the diagonal entries, we can see that the indexes are sort of matched up nicely. It was A11, C11, A12, C12, A1n, C1n. So the, the cofactors and the coefficients A, they matched correctly and this agreed with the definition of the determinant, so that was just equal to the definition of the determinant. Over here, it doesn't seem like they match. At least it doesn't seem like it would match if we were just thinking about the matrix A. So we have to sort of think about what else this could be. So what I want us to think about is a matrix which is related to A, but not exactly the same as A. So we'll think about this matrix here. Let's call it A. Consider a twiddle. So A twiddle is going to be very much like A, but not exactly like A. I'm going to have the first row exactly the same. And then the second row, or have I done this the wrong way around? I'm going to actually make it the, yeah, okay, so the first row is not exactly the same. You need to give this a little bit of thought. Okay. We're going to keep the second row the same. And I'm going to replace the first row with a copy of the second row. And the third row then continues as normal, as A32, A3N all the way down to A, N1, A, N2, A, N, N, like this. Okay. So what we've done is we've replaced one of the rows here, we've replaced the, replaced the first row with the second row. So replaced, so this is the change. So we replace row one with row two. And let's think about what happens if we were to calculate the determinant of a twiddle by expanding along this row. Right. Yes. Yes, th th this is a useful observation that we will make in a moment. Okay, so the so let's let's note this. Okay, so we note that the determinant of a twiddle is equal to zero when 
because we have identical rows. But we can get another expression for the determinant of a twiddle, right? If you wanted to calculate this determinant, we could calculate this determinant by expanding along, uh, let's say we expanded along this row, right? So you would take a21 and you would multiply it by the appropriate cofactor. In this case, it would be the cofactor C21. Let me call this C twiddle21. It's the cofactor that belongs to A twiddle. Plus A22 multiplied by C twiddle. Uh, no, why? Yeah, yeah. C twiddle C. No, sorry, sorry. These indexes are wrong. 1, 1. 1, 2, plus A to N, C twiddle, 1 N. Okay. And now the claim that I'm going to make is that this cofactor here in the first row, first column of this matrix A twiddle is the same as the cofactor in the first row, first column of the original matrix A. Okay, and the reason for that is the only difference between this matrix A and A twiddle is that we have we've changed something in the first row. So all the cofactors that came from the first row, when you evaluate those cofactors, you're going to have to calculate minors, and those minors will be formed by omitting that row. You'll ignore that row and some column, but you'll be ignoring the row that has changed. So all of these cofactors from this strange matrix A twiddle agree with the cofactors from the original matrix A. So this is now the same as uh, A21 C11 plus A22 C12 plus, plus A2N C1N. Okay, and that's since well, what are, uh, since the only row that has changed is the row that we ignore when we calculate the minors. And now if we've done this correctly, this expression over here, which we know is equal to zero, right? This expression over here, you can see we've got A21, C11, A22, C12. The indexes don't quite match the way they did for the determinant of A. But they should agree with the expression that we have up here, right? They should agree with A21, C11, A22, C12, all the way up to A2N, C1N. A21 C11 plus A22 C1. In fact, hold on, I can just zoom out and then we can fit it all on the same screen. So that expression that we have up here agrees with this expression that we have here. And this expression evaluates to zero because the determinant is zero because two rows are identical, which means that that up there should also be equal to zero, right? So we need a, a line here concluding all of that. So this entry so that entry there, one of these off-diagonal entries, is equal to zero. Now we've only shown that one of the off-diagonal entries is equal to zero. We've shown that the entry in the second row in the first column is equal to zero. What we can actually do is we can use this same idea to show that all the off-diagonal entries are equal to zero. What we had to do for this particular entry is that we had to show, we had to replace the first row with the second row. In general, if you want to show that the AJK entry is equal to zero, you replace the K row with the J row. But you can do this, you just have to do a little bit of work for each one. We're not going to go through each one, but the same idea holds, right? So similarly, we can show A times by the adjoint of A JK is equal to zero. 
when uh, j is not equal to k by considering with row k of a. Like that. And now we've shown that all the entries on the diagonal should just be equal to the determinant, and all the entries off the diagonal are equal to zero. Yes? Well, it's not a completely different matrix, right? It's a, a matrix A twiddle, which is identical in all the rows except one row, and that one row we've now just replaced with a copy of a previous row. Um, and that forces the determinant to be equal to zero. I mean, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding you. You can come and speak to me afterwards, and we can try to work through this. All right. Okay. So this was now factor 2. Point, uh, where are we? Yeah, 2.13. So this tells us that A times by the adjoint of A is equal to the determinant of A multiplied by the identity matrix. So if the determinant of A is non-zero, this gives you an alternative way of calculating inverses. So if determinant of A, this is a remark, 2.14. So if the determinant of A is not equal to zero, then we can divide through by the determinant of A, and we get that A multiplied by one over the determinant of A times by the adjoint of A is equal to the identity matrix. And that implies that one over the determinant of A times by the adjoint of A is equal to the inverse of A, right? So this is just saying that we can, we could if we wanted to, we could calculate the inverse of A in this way. You may actually have used this formula before in the two by two case. You may know a formula for quickly finding the inverse of a two by two case where you leave some entries in the same place and you swap some other entries and you add some minus signs and then you divide the whole thing by something. Well, that's actually just this formula over here. The swapping of the entries and the multiplying by minuses is the adjoint, and the dividing, the thing that you're dividing by, if you go back and think about that formula, the dividing that you're doing is dividing by the determinant, right? So we, we've actually seen this before, and you may have even used it before, without actually knowing what you're doing. Well, now you do know what you're doing. This is, this is the, another alternative way of, of calculating the inverse. Um, but let's just say something like this. This is hard to do computationally. It's expensive. There are lots of operations that you need to do. It's much quicker just to do Gauss reduction, right? In practice, you do, you do Gauss reduction if you want to calculate inverses. <coughs> In fact, 2.15 has its own name, Cromer's rule. And this is just telling you another sort of theoretically useful thing, but again, computationally, it's not as quick as just doing Gauss reduction. This tells you something about how you can calculate solutions uh, to systems of equations, right? So if AX is equal to B and A is invertible, then the solution x, which is just x1, x2, xn, can be determined in the following way. Can be determined in the following way. Can be determined by xj. The jth entry is just equal to uh, 
the determinant of AJ divided by the determinant of A. And that matrix AJ, where AJ is the matrix A with its jth column. matrix A with its jth column replaced by B. This is another way of solving um, AX is equal to B. Again, the quicker way to solve this is just to write an augmented matrix AX is equal to B and you do the Gauss reduction, but this over here, uh, you know, it's an alternative way of doing it. Um, I think the explanation for this is in next week's tutorial as well. So we're not going to do an explanation now. Let's just actually write it up and say explanation tutorial problem. All right. And then there's one last very important result. Oh, yes. Only, only works for square matrices, yeah, because the, that matrix A must be invertible, and you can't invert a matrix unless it's a square matrix. Yeah. So there's one last uh, result. About... No, that's, that's not good. Hold on. That's uh, still not good. <laughs> All right, there we go. So there's one last very important result about determinants, and this is the, the end of the section on determinants. Um, and it basically, yes, please scroll up, yep. says that the following statements are all completely equivalent to each other, right? And this is basically just going to tie together a bunch of different things that we've seen. Uh, so the first statement is that your determinant, if you've got the determinant of A not equal to zero, that's equivalent to saying that A is invertible. And saying that A is invertible is equivalent to the first statement, and they're both equivalent to saying that AX is equal to B has a unique solution. And those three statements are all equivalent to saying that the columns of A Uh, form a linearly independent set. And then there's one more statement here which I'm going to write in, although I'm just going to call it 4B. 4B is just saying the rows of A form a linearly independent set. I won't worry too much about 4B. Uh, I guess the important thing here is just to realize that because the transpose doesn't, uh, doesn't change the value of the determinant, if something is true for the columns, it must also be true for the rows. So the columns of A being linearly independent will also immediately get that the rows are linearly independent. So we have these four statements here, 
and they're completely equivalent. So as soon as you know one of these things is true, you, you know the rest of them are true as well. This does also give you uh, maybe a nice way of checking whether or not a, a particular set is linearly dependent or independent. If it's a set of uh, n vectors in Rn, just write it down as a matrix and calculate its determinant, and then you get the, the value here. Okay, but let's go ahead and let's actually try to prove this, and maybe just as a, a first step, I want us to think about all the different implications that we have here. Right, so we've got these four statements. You've got one, two, three, four, and I've said that they're all equivalent to each other. So that means that we've got the following implications. One must imply two, and two must imply one. And one must imply three, and three must imply one. And one must imply four, and four must imply one. And two must imply three, and three must imply two, and two must imply four, and four must imply two, and three must imply four, and four must imply three. Right, so there's a lot of implications here. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, twelve. There are twelve of them. What is the least amount of work that we need to do? What is the least amount of implications that we have to prove to show that these are all equivalent to each other? All twelve. Any takers for all twelve? No, no, we, we don't need all twelve. Could we do it with just half? Could we do it with six of them? Five of them? One. No, no, we need more than one. Four of them? Four. Okay, we can do this with just four. And so what we're going to try to do is we're going to show the following. We want to show that one implies two, two implies three, three implies four, and four implies one. If we can show just those ones that I've uh, highlighted in green, then we get the rest as well, right? Because then if you want to know, does one imply three? Yes, it does, because it implies two and two implies three. Does three imply two? Yes, it does, because one implies two, right? So if we do these four implications, we get actually the whole theorem. So let's write this down very quickly. So we've got one implies two. So what was one implies two? Uh, determinant of A is not equal to zero. A is invertible. Oh, hold on. We've already seen that. That was remark... 2.14, okay, so we get that one for free. Two implies three, so two implies three. We want to show that if A is invertible, AX is equal to B has a unique solution. So what do we do here? We want to get X is equal to something well, okay, let's start. We've got AX is equal to B. And A is invertible, so A inverse exists. So we get an expression for B. I mean, an expression for X. There, that, this is it. That's your unique solution. The unique solution is A inverse acting on B. 3 implies uh, 4. And what is 3 implies 4? Okay, unique solution. Columns of A form a linearly independent set. Okay, so I'm going to say the following. Let's say let B be equal to the zero vector. Then AX is equal to zero has a unique solution. But how is that showing us that the columns of A are linearly independent? Okay, definition of linear independence and? Okay, so if you think about matrix multiplication, we said that one way you can think of matrix multiplication is matrix multiplication is a linear combination of the columns of A with coefficients x. This is a unique solution, x is equal to 0. So the only linear combination of the columns of A that adds up to 0 is the trivial one, which is the definition of linear independence. 
right? So this is now the same thing as a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus a n x n equals to zero has unique soul implies linear independence. Right? And then from four back to one. So now we've got to say if we've got a column from the, the columns of A are linearly uh, independent, how do we know that the determinant is non-zero? Well, one thing we could do is we could take the, the matrix A, and if the columns are linearly independent, and we then Gauss reduced, we know that we'd be able to find, uh, after the Gauss reduction, we'd find pivots in every row, right? If you don't find pivots in every row, it means that your, um, your set of vectors must have been linearly dependent. And if you've got pivots in every row, the determinant of that matrix is equal to one. And all the Gauss reduction operations that you've done multiply by a scalar, but they multiply by a non-zero scalar. They can't change the determinant from zero to non-zero or from non-zero to zero. So the determinant must be a non-zero scalar multiplied by one, which is non-zero. Yes? No, but how do you know that they're not uh, part of the same plane or something? And yeah. Oh, okay, wait, this is, again, your volume argument, right? No, 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 I mean, like, yeah, because, because the thing is, they are not... Yeah, okay, yeah, mm. the, 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 the argument that you're making here is basically invoking the rank nullity theorem, and it's true, um, but we haven't seen that theorem. Okay, but yes, that, that, that also works. Okay. Um, let's just say... Finish this one yourselves. You can take a look at what we've got up in the notes.